This is part two of the concept of perfusion, which covers deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. We left off discussing the nursing process at the stage of implementation. As thrombi develop, they occlude the lumen of the vein and obstruct blood flow. In addition, the accompanying inflammatory process and response may precipitate vessel spasms. And this further impairs arterial and venous blood flow as well as tissue perfusion. Impaired tissue perfusion in turn deprives tissues of nutrients and oxygen. As a result, distal tissues of the affected extremity are at risk for ulceration and infection. So nursing interventions include the following. Assess the skin of the affected lower leg and foot at least every eight hours or more often as indicated. Frequent assessment is important to detect early signs of tissue breakdown and implement measures to protect vulnerable tissues. Early intervention allows healing and restoration of tissue integrity. If allowed to continue, the process can lead to necrosis and potential gangrene. Okay, the next Nursing intervention includes elevating the patient's extremity at all times, keeping knees slightly flexed and legs above the level of the heart. Elevation of the extremities promotes venous return and reduces peripheral edema. Knee flexion promotes muscle relaxation. The next nursing intervention includes using mild soaps, solutions, and lotions to clean the affected leg and foot daily. We need to pat them dry after washing and apply non-alcohol-based lotion or moisturizing cream. Again, maintaining skin integrity is the first line of defense against infection. Problem with harsh soaps and drying solutions is that the skin can become cracked and increase the risk for infection. And then the next intervention is to use egg crate mattress or sheepskin on the bed as needed. This distributes the patient's weight more evenly, preventing pressure ulcers. And then next, for promoting effective peripheral perfusion is encouraging frequent position changes. We like to say at least every two hours while the patient is awake. Frequent position changes reduce pressure on bony prominences and edematous tissue, reducing again that risk of tissue breakdown. Um, we also need to make sure that we encourage active range of motion this is also to reduce the risk for injury um, and to encourage mobility. Okay. Provide passive range of motion as needed. Remember that's passive is by the nurse, but active range of motion also helps prevent muscle atrophy and preserve function. While passive range of motion exercises do not prevent muscle atrophy, they do maintain joint mobility. Okay, a, another intervention to, for encouraging mobility would be simply to encourage frequent position changes. And that most importantly, uh, encourage deep breathing and coughing. Prolonged immobility can lead to impaired airway clearance and respiratory complications such as pneumonia and atelectasis. Turn, cough, and deep breathe. We abbreviate that as a capital TCDB because it is so important to facilitate the expulsion of secretions from the respiratory tract to promote airway clearance and alveolar ventilation. Encourage increased fluid and dietary fiber intake. Constipation is a complication of immobility 
that results from decreased GI motility and the loss of abdominal muscle strength. Increasing fluid and fiber intake helps maintain soft, easily expelled stools, which I'm sure you already know, but I'm repeating it. Okay, and also we can assist patients with and encourage ambulation as allowed. Ambulation promotes venous blood flow, helps to maintain muscle tone and joint mobility, and overall increases a sense of well-being with our patients. Okay. Now we're going to talk about, um, we're still talking about the nursing process implementation, but how we can reduce the risk for injury. Anticoagulant therapy interferes with the body's normal clotting mechanisms, increasing the risk for bleeding and hemorrhage. Interventions to reduce the patient's risk for adverse effects from anticoagulant therapy include the following. The nurse should monitor the laboratory results, including the PT and INR and the PTT, as well as the H and H, the hemoglobin and hematocrit. The nurse is also responsible for reporting values that are outside the normal or the desired therapeutic range. Coagulation studies are used to monitor the effect of anticoagulant medications. Values within the desired range prevent further clot development while carrying a low risk for bleeding and hemorrhage. A fall in the H&H &H may indicate undetected bleeding. In this slide, we also see normal values. Um, these are the normal values that I like to use, but um, mostly because they're very easy, nice round numbers, especially with the PTT, 20 to 40 seconds is a nice normal uh, PTT. Remember, in these patients who want to form clots or have formed clots, or we want to prevent clot formation, we would probably going to put them in the therapeutic range which would be much higher because the PTT would be prolonged with heparin usage. Um, we, I think we already talked about the INR normal value is one, and we always mention the therapeutic ranges for the various ones related to that. Okay, so we have to be able to know the normal ranges so that if you have an, an exam question related to that, a therapeutic range that we know if indeed that's uh, what we need to do next. Um, so make sure you do know normal so you can calculate um, therapeutic ranges and see if they're adequate for the patient. Patient outcomes are evaluated based on their progress in meeting the established goals and may include the following. The patient will identify warning signs of DVT. The patient vocalizes the risks associated with decreased motility. The patient maintains an anticoagulant therapy regimen without complications. Excellent goal. The patient and nurse collaborate with the interprofessional team to identify DVT recurrence strategies. The patient is free of long-term complications. If patient outcomes are not met, recurrent DVT or other complications may develop. Depending upon the extent and severity of complications, the patient may require hospitalization and surgical intervention. There is, um, at this time, I'm going to mention a safety alert that your textbook has on page 1221. Sudden increases in heart rate, stabbing chest pain, shortness of breath, and bloody cough may indicate that a DVT has moved through the bloodstream to the lungs, causing a PE. Patients with a PE may require emergency care.
pulmonary embolism, PE, or pulmonary thromboembolism is the obstruction of blood flow in part of the pulmonary vascular system by an embolus. An embolus is a particle or aggregate of blood, fat, or pathogens, or a bubble of air traveling from one area of the body to another. Thromboemboli that develop in the venous system or the right side of the heart are the most frequent cause of PE. Other sources of emboli include tumors that have invaded the venous circulation, fat or bone marrow entering the circulation as a result of fracture or other trauma, amniotic fluid released into the circulation during childbirth, and intravenous injection of air or other foreign substances. PE is a medical emergency. 50% of deaths from PE occur within the first two hours following the embolization. In many cases, DVT has not been recognized or treated. Often, embolization also goes undetected. Prompt treatment, though, can help save lives and prevent complications associated with PEs. And so here is the pulmonary emboli highway that we um, talk about. And first, it starts down here in the lower extremities. Oftentimes, it's just an area of trauma or, uh, for example, in a bedridden individual, venous stasis. Okay, so that increased coagulation, uh, we have the development of a clot. This becomes traveling, it becomes an embolus, embolus, and this is the right side. It returns to the right side of the heart through the venous circulation, through the right atrium, the tricuspid, the right ventricle, and then through the lungs. Again, when it gets to the bifurcation of the pulmonary arteries, uh, it could go either way. It could go to the right or left lung. In this picture, we see it going to the patient's left lung. And it's going to continue traveling until the lumen becomes too small for it to pass. And there it gets stuck. Okay. Everything distal to that, the lung parenchyma, remember this is not the airways, this is the blood circulation. Everything distal to that is deprived of uh, blood. Okay, so um, how do we diagnose the pulmonary embolism? Well, we do first because it's quickest and um, it's non-invasive. We'll do a scan. It's called the VQ scan. Sometimes they'll do... Um, another type of scan called a spiral uh, scan. So if you hear a patient is going down for a spiral, you know that they're looking for the presence of a PE. But the definitive test is the pulmonary angiogram. Angiography is always the gold standard because when they come back from the scan and they can't determine for sure if there is a blood clot there, that it's um, inconclusive, the findings of the scan are inconclusive, then you need to prepare your patient because you can expect that they're gonna be going down for a more invasive test, an angiography, okay? Where this requires the injection of dye, but it is definitive in terms of diagnosing our pulmonary emboli. A match between blood flow through the pulmonary vasculature, which is perfusion, and lung ventilation, that's through the airways, is necessary for effective gas exchange to occur, which is called respiration. 
Local factors regulate ventilation and perfusion to maintain this match. Okay. The impact of a pulmonary embolus depends on the extent to which pulmonary blood flow is obstructed, the size of the embolus, its nature, and any secondary effects of the obstruction. The effects can vary widely. Occlusion of a large pulmonary artery with, can lead to sudden death. Gas exchange is significantly reduced or prevented and cardiac output falls dramatically as blood fails to move through the pulmonary vascular system and return to the left side of the heart. See, again, we keep coming back to cardiac output. Remember, we call this the cardiopulmonary system for a reason, because they are dependent on each other for efficient um, functioning. The effects can um, lead to lung tissue infarction. This is caused by occlusion of a significant portion of pulmonary blood flow. Uh, another effect could be obstruction of a small segment of the pulmonary circulation with no permanent lung injury. That would be excellent. Um, another effect could be chronic or recurrent, possibly multiple small emboli with recurring symptoms. Yeah, we do see that a lot. Okay. Obstruction of pulmonary blood flow by an embolus affects both perfusion and ventilation. In severe cases, this can lead to pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular heart failure. System, systemically, hypotension and a drop in cardiac output may develop. Bronchoconstriction occurs in the affected area of the lung. Dead space, which is areas of the lung that are ventilated but not perfused, increases. Alveolar surfactant decreases, increasing the risk for atelectasis. Now, if infarction does not occur, the fibrinolytic system ultimately dissolves the clot and pulmonary function returns to normal. If infarction does occur, the infarcted tissue becomes scarred and fibrotic. Fat emboli are the most common non-thrombotic pulmonary emboli. A fat embolism usually occurs after fracture of a long bone and typically the femur. This releases bone marrow fat into the circulation. Adipose tissue or liver trauma may also lead to fat emboli. This is very important and you will have nursing questions related to this. Frequently, the stem of the question will state a scenario such as a firefighter fell off the roof. He had a long bone fracture. And then it'll say signs and symptoms of a PE. And you are supposed to know that the long bone fracture has released fat into the circulation and has caused a PE. Okay, so this is a typical scenario. They want to see if you understand the pathophysiology of PEs and how they're related to long bone fracture. Okay. The etiology of PEs, that's what causes them, okay? Thrombus arising from the deep veins of the leg is the leading cause okay, of PE. Fat emboli, which occur because of trauma or surgery are less common. The risk factors for PE are similar to those risk factors for DVT and include stasis of venous blood flow, vessel wall damage, and altered blood coagulation. There is also inherited thrombophilias and certain cancers 
that produce coagulation factors, um, making clot formation more likely in these cancer patients. Risk factors for DVT include prolonged immobility, trauma, including hip and femur fractures, surgery, especially orthopedic and pelvic type of surgeries, heart attack and heart failure are risk factors. Also obesity and advanced age. There is also a family history of DVT or PE that may indicate an increased risk for the condition. Um, we see that women who use oral contraceptives or estrogen um, hormone therapy are at risk, as are women during pregnancy and childbirth. Smoking cigarettes also increases the risk of pulmonary emboli. We see that there's a higher incidence of PE in our black patients than our white patients. Although other disorders, um, clotting disorders, are more prominent in our white patients than in our black patients. Of course, we see the, the risk factors listed here for you. Um, to begin preventing PE, it's crucial to prevent the clots caused by DVT. Okay. Hospitals commonly take aggressive measures to prevent such clots, including administering anticoagulants before or after an operation for patients who are at risk for clots, or for those who were admitted with a heart attack, stroke, or cancer complication. Another risk factor is related to um, procoagulant disorders. We see that um, genetic predisposition to hypercoagulability accounts for approximately 20% of PEs. The most common inherited condition is the factor V Le Leiden mutation and also the prothrombin gene mutation. So there are inherited conditions that can lead to this hypercoagulability. Remember, we talked about Virchow's triad, and that accounts for up to 20% of pulmonary embolisms. The clinical manifestations of PE depend on the size and location of the emboli. Small emboli may be asymptomatic. Manifestations usually develop abruptly over a period of minutes. Yes, because I've seen this occur. It's quite abrupt and it's, it's startling to the person who's taking care of this patient. The most common symptoms are dyspnea and pleuritic chest pain. What do we mean by pleuritic chest pain? They would describe this pain differently. It's a knife-like, a sharp knife-like pain in the chest, but it is related to breathing. It, it usually would be more intense upon taking a deep breath. Anxiety, a sense of impending doom, uh, and cough are also common. Okay, so you probably want to highlight that phrase, sense of impending doom. And what do we mean by that? Prior to having a PE, patients will get this overwhelming sense that something bad is going to happen. They may even verbalize that they think they're going to die. That is not for you to say, oh, to reassure them that they're not going to die. No, that's an assessment finding, a subjective data that you need to bring together to, uh, to um, suspect that your patient is going to have a pulmonary embolism. Um, diaphoresis and hemoptysis may develop. A massive pulmonary embolus can cause fainting, syncope, and cyanosis. On examination, tachycardia and tachypnea are noted. Remember, these people are, are having this abrupt interruption in their breathing and the efficiency of their um, breathing. 
So they are going to be gasping for air. Anytime somebody is hypoxic, their heart rate goes up and their breathing rate goes up. Crackles may be heard on auscultation of the chest. They even could develop a new heart sound, a cardiac gallop, S3 and possibly an S4 as a result of having a PE. So assessment is very important in putting this picture together because we want to intervene rapidly. They could also develop a low-grade fever. It's difficult to differentiate PE from heart attack or pneumonia by the signs and symptoms alone. So you need to really um, do a, a good assessment and pick up on subtle changes. Um, always suspect pulmonary embolus if there's a sudden collapse one to two weeks after surgery. Think about what the surgical patient undergoes. Okay, so all of those factors that contribute to an increased risk of developing clots and PEs. So characteristic manifestations of fat emboli include sudden onset of cardiopulmonary and neurologic symptoms, including dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardia, confusion, and decreased level of consciousness. This picture shows uh, the signs and symptoms of PEs. Remember, they vary according to size and location. I wanted to show you this because if they would have a large or massive PE as shown in this picture where the word clot is, you see we have a large clot that is straddling the bifurcation of the pulmonary arteries. This is referred to as a saddle. So you will see this sometimes in the history uh, and, or in, when you're getting report in your patient that he's diagnosed, he or she is diagnosed with a saddle uh, embolism. So that's what we're talking about. You can just visually by looking at this see the huge interruption in uh, blood flow to the lungs. And of course, even with heparin therapy, it's only going to prevent the clot from getting bigger and for more clots developing. So heparin is not going to dissolve this clot. Again, what's going to dissolve this clot? Yes, the patient's own fibrinolytic um, processes will dissolve the clot. We just have to prevent it and hope that it doesn't um, dislodge or get worse, okay? So again, a review slide in a picture format that you can look over this and it talks about risk factors at the bottom. It shows you the how they travel north up to the lungs. And it just has symptoms here and also it, it, it talks about um, uh, ABG results. Okay, I love that part. Uh, so you can see um, what occurs. Um, we have the pleuritic chest pain. We called it knife-like sharp pains and they have the knife up there. And we have IV heparin because this is an emergent situation. Okay. Now, the sad truth is that DVT may not be identified until a PE occurs. That's why prevention is the primary goal in treating PEs. Early ambulation of our patients, both medical and surgical patients, need to have early ambulation. That is an effective means of preventing venous stasis and reducing the incidence of PE. This is where I get on my soapbox and I tell you, nurses, you can save lives by doing very simple interventions. To, this saves lives. So early ambulation, 
patient needs to be encouraged to get up and walk. If they're in too much pain, then we need to relieve their pain so that they can get up and walk. Okay. As well, external pneumatic compression of the legs is also effective for patients who've undergone surgeries. Um, other preventive measures include elevating the legs and active and passive leg exercises. I know that sounds boring, but I can't stress how important it is. Um, when applying external pneumatic compression boots, be sure to apply the correct size boots. Compression boots that are too small or too large will be ineffective at preventing DVTs and PEs. Ensure that the boots of all sizes, including extra large boots, are on hand. When PE occurs, treatment is supportive. Oxygen therapy is initiated. Remember, the primary nursing diagnosis is ineffective tissue perfusion. Pulmonary. When there's ineffective tissue perfusion, a direct intervention would be to supply supplemental oxygen therapy. Analgesics may be ordered to relieve severe pleuritic pain and anxiety. Pulmonary artery and wedge pressures are monitored with a balloon called the Swan-Gans catheter. This is only occurs in the ICU and we don't really talk too much about um, Swan-Gans catheters or hemodynamic monitoring in this course. Cardiac outputs are measured. That also can be done in the, with a pulmonary artery catheter in the ICU. Uh, cardiac rhythms are monitored to detect any arrhythmias. Okay. Criteria that indicate risk for PE include the following. The patient has a pulse rate greater than 99 beats per minute. Pulse oximetry, less than 95% on room air. Um, the patient has a history of DVT or PEs. Hemoptysis, recent surgery or trauma requiring hospitalization. Um, certainly cancer as well. We've already explained that. Unilateral leg swelling or limb pain. If the criteria testing indicates that the patient is at risk for a PE, then the patient should undergo further testing. Studies that um, performed to diagnose pulmonary emboli include the plasma D-dimer levels. We already um, explained the D-dimer levels as being highly specific to the presence of a clot. Remember, D-dimer is a fragment of fibrin formed during lysis of a blood clot. Elevated levels indicate a clot has formed and is being broken down. The principal test used to diagnose PE is a CAT scan of the chest with contrast. Chest CT effectively shows large central pulmonary emboli. Newer generation scans also can detect peripheral emboli. Okay, so a lot of times a spiral CT is what you'll hear. And when you hear that your patient's going down for a spiral, well then that means that they're looking for the presence of a pulmonary embolus. Lung scans, including VQ scans may be used in perfusion in a perfusion lung scan. We use radio tagged albumin injected intravenously and distributed in the lungs by pulmonary blood flow to detect the presence of a PE. An area of a lung in which isotope cannot be detected is suggestive of occluded blood flow and a PE. For a ventilation scan, a radiotagged gas is inhaled and the lungs are scanned for gas distribution. 
Combined perfusion and ventilation scans allow identification of areas of the lungs that are ventilated but not perfused, which is a mismatch between ventilation and perfusion. This is what is characteristic of pulmonary embolism. Also, we have the definitive test for PE, the CT pulmonary angiography. When the other tests, the other less invasive tests are inconclusive, it's possible to detect very small emboli with angiography. Therefore, it's considered the gold standard, but it is invasive. It requires contrast medium being injected into the pulmonary arteries and illustrates the pulmonary vascular system on x-ray. We can use chest x-ray also. This is especially uh, beneficial for looking at pulmonary infiltrates and occasionally pleural effusion, okay? Because of the presence, it's, it's not that it identifies the PE, but it shows if the PE is present, then we can have fluid building up or infiltrates in the lungs. We can also use the ECG electrocardiogram to rule out acute MIs as a cause of these symptoms because sometimes these symptoms can be misleading. We have to identify what is causing the shortness of breath, etc. Okay, um, and we already talked about a little bit about EKGs yesterday in lecture, and we know that some findings that are associated with PE. Um, well, we didn't talk specifically about PE, but we can have EKG uh, changes as a result of these uh, PEs, and especially in terms of the T wave. So we can look for that. If there's a PE, we may see specific T wave changes. And then our arterial blood gases, which you studied last semester. What are the ABGs going to show when somebody's having a PE? But certainly it shows hypoxemia. Remember hypoxemia is different than hypoxia. The technical definition for hypoxemia is a PaO2 less than 80 millimeters of mercury. The ABG often shows respiratory alkalosis with a pH greater than 7.45 and a PaCO2 of less than 35. Um, and the reason for that is because the patient is gasping for air, they are hyperventilating, and this causes um, tachypnea, an increase in respiratory rate. Okay. And we also have other tests um, you can read about in title, carbon dioxide measurements in your textbook. Um, coagulation studies, we already went over, they're ordered to monitor the response to therapy. We want the PTT um, to assess the intrinsic clotting pathway and the response to heparin, okay? Desired levels with anticoagulant therapy are one and a half to two times the control value. So that's why you need to know normal values and multiply it by one and a half or two to see if your patient is in the therapeutic range. The risk of recurrent thromboembolism is high at the lower levels, okay, when the PTT is at the lower levels, but the risk of bleeding increases at the higher levels. That's why we have a therapeutic range. We don't want it too low. We don't want it too high. When it comes to Coumadin therapy, we're going to use the PTINR to assess the extrinsic clotting system and oral anticoagulation with Coumadin. The goal of anticoagulant therapy is to achieve a therapeutic INR range of two to three times normal. Therefore, you need to know what's normal. It's easy with INR, it's one, but the PT, you have to know the normal range so that you can make sure that it is two to three times normal. Um, all right. Anticoagulant therapy is the standard treatment for preventing pulmonary emboli. It is often initiated in high-risk patients who have no evidence of PE to prevent possible devastating effects. 
in the patient with a DVT or a pulmonary embolus, anticoagulants are administered to prevent further clotting and embolization. For the patient with a pulmonary embolus, heparin therapy is initiated with an IV bolus followed by continuous infusion. The PTT is monitored frequently until stabilized. Heparin therapy is typically continued for approximately five days or until oral anticoagulant therapy has become fully effective. Oral anticoagulant therapy with Coumadin is initiated at the same time as heparin. Warfarin alters the synthesis of vitamin K dependent clotting factors and it requires five to seven days to be fully effective. Anticoagulant therapy is continued for several months, two to three months, when, uh, when there are few risk factors for thromboemboli exist. But long-term therapy is used when patients have chronic disorders that increase their risk of emboli. Bleeding is a risk factor associated with anticoagulant therapy. Although major hemorrhage is uncommon, it occurs in approximately 5% of patients receiving IV heparin. Cardiac, hepatic, and renal disease all increase the risk of significant bleeding, as does an age over 60 years. I want to add um, to that last slide that factor X uh, inhibitors are also, um, that's factor 10 inhibitors, are also effective and result in fewer side effects and drug interactions. Okay, we already, we're going to talk about protamine um, is used as an antidote to stop the anticoagulant effect if major bleeding occurs. Um, when our patient is on um, heparin. Vitamin K is given to treat bleeding associated with Coumadin therapy. Okay, now this slide here, we're talking about fibrinolytic therapy. That's different than anticoagulant therapy. This can be used to treat a massive PE and hypotension. Some examples of fibrinolytic agents include streptokinase, urokinase, or TPA, which is tissue, tissue plasminogen activators. These fibrinolytic therapy uh, agents are used to lyse or break up or disintegrate the clot, the embolus, and then restore pulmonary blood flow and reduce pulmonary artery and right heart pressures. Okay, do know that fibrinolysis significantly increases the risk of bleeding, particularly cerebral bleeding. So there are contraindications to using these clot busters, as I like to call them, including intracranial disease, um, recent stroke. If they've just recently had surgery or any active bleeding, um, then they're not gonna be candidates for using fibrinolysis because the increased risk of hemorrhage um, makes it contraindicated. Nursing diagnoses appropriate for a patient with pulmonary embolism may include the following, impaired gas exchange. The primary and most emergent focus of nursing care for the patient with PE is to promote oxygenation and gas exchange. Remember that this impaired gas exchange is the result of that mismatch between ventilation and perfusion. Another nursing diagnosis is decreased cardiac output. We need to make sure that we preserve cardiac output. Okay, um, blood return to the left side of the heart at, when a person has a pulmonary embolism impacts cardiac output and it can cause a significant decrease in cardiac output. So nursing interventions will focus on preserving adequate blood pressure and organ perfusion. 
until the cardiopulmonary status stabilizes. Ineffective protection, um, especially we need to promote safety when we are administering fibrinolytics and anticoagulant therapy because they impair normal clotting mechanisms and increase the risk for bleeding and hemorrhage. Um, others include acute pain and anxiety. Um, a PE is physiologic and psychologic threat to safety and integrity. It is a major physiologic stressor eliciting a strong neuroendocrine stress response. The feeling of suffocation and inability to catch one's breath that accompanies a pulmonary embolism is also a strong psychological stressor. Fear, anxiety, and apprehension are common responses. The nurse should provide continuous assessment and evaluation of the patient with a PE. Even if the patient is currently stable, the status can change at any moment, especially if additional blood clots dislodge and travel to the lungs. The nurse should have assessment tools and treatments readily available to care for the patient at risk for a PE. And the problem is this, because the prognosis is uh, is really poor. It can be poor because of the complications that develop. These are some of the stats associated with PEs. The 30-day mortality of an acute massive PE is about 50%. Okay, so uh, you have a 50/50 chance of making it in 30. You know, at the in the time interval of 30 days if you have a massive PE, okay? So a high mortality rate associated with it. Um, and of those people that die, approximately 10% occurs within the first hour. 80% of those that die occurs within the first two hours. So we're talking about a very emergent situation. Um, and the operative mortality of stable patients is about 30%, okay? So even, um, even when we, uh, so this is because there is such a high mortality rate associated with PEs, it is important that we prevent the development of DVTs. Okay, let's talk about some of the goals. The goals for the patient may include that they will have an oxygenation, uh, a saturation, oxygen saturation of greater than 94%. Um, the patient may, uh, will, what would I say will, verbalize fears resulting from respiratory distress. The patient will obtain relief from pain to allow for adequate rest and comfort and the patient will demonstrate adequate tissue perfusion. We need to know what are the signs and symptoms of normal perfusion versus not uh, tissue that is not being perfused. The patient's vital signs will remain within normal limits. These are generic goals. They need to be um, adapted to our individual patients. Well, we already mentioned this, but implementation uh, means that we have to compensate for impaired gas exchange. What are some of the things that we can do for our patient to compensate for this impaired gas exchange? Well, um, we said before that PE results in areas of the lung that are ventilated, but they're not perfused. So that means those areas of the lung don't receive any capillary blood flow. Um, nursing interventions are directed toward compensating for that impaired gas exchange, and they include placing the patient in a Fowler or high Fowler's position. That means hanging over the side of the bed with their lower extremities being dependent. This position facilitates maximum lung expansion and reduces 
Venus return to the right side of the heart. That when you reduce Venus return to the right side of the heart, you are decreasing preload, the amount of stretch that the uh, and workload of the heart. This will lower pressures in the pulmonary vascular system as well. Another implementation or intervention would be to maintain the patient on bed rest because bed rest reduces metabolic demands and tissue needs for oxygen. The nurse should frequently assess the patient's respiratory status, including the rate, the depth, and the effort, auscultate their lung sounds, and monitor their oxygen saturation. Impaired ventilation will further compromise gas exchange and worsen the hypoxemia. Oxygen saturation can be monitored continuously and non-invasively to evaluate gas exchange. We also will monitor the patient's ABG results and report any abnormal findings as indicated. ABG results are used to assess gas exchange and tissue oxygenation. Sometimes the patient may have an arterial line if they're in the ICU, and this can be used to continuously monitor arterial pressures. And we can also use it to sample arterial blood for the ABG testing. Okay, the impact of the large pulmonary embolus on the hemodynamic status can be significant. Okay, pressures in the pulmonary vasculature and the right side of the heart increase. Blood return to the left side of the heart and cardiac output may significantly decrease with a massive pul uh, pulmonary embolus. So nursing interventions focus on preserving adequate blood pressure and perfusion to the vital organs until they can stabilize that cardiopulmonary status. Uh, we want to instruct the patient to report chest pain and other symptoms. Assess the patient's skin color and temperature. These are related directly to tissue perfusion. Auscultate heart sounds at least every two to four hours and report any abnormalities such as extra heart sounds and S3 or S4 gallop. They indicate that the heart is compromised. Monitor the patient's cardiac rhythm. A drop in cardiac output can result from PEs and can precipitate dysrhythmias, which in turn can further impair cardiac output. We may have to administer vasopressors and other medications Vasopressors are used to increase blood pressures in our patient. Um, we have to maintain an adequate blood pressure so that the tissues are perfused. Monitor the patient's pulmonary artery pressures. Um, we can do that with a catheter in the ICU, we can, but we can also assess things like neck vein distension and peripheral edema. Okay, and certainly we want to maintain IV and arterial access sites in a central line um, because the patient can become unstable and, and, and be in a critical condition and we would need to immediately intervene to maintain life. We need access to the vasculature, those access sites. As nurses, we promote safety. And we can do this by assessing the patient's medication regimen for possible drug interactions that could potentiate or inhibit anticoagulant effects. We can maintain adequate fluid intake, assess the patient frequently for both obvious and hidden signs of bleeding. Hidden signs would include, uh, well, other signs would include bleeding gums, hematuria, occult blood in the stool or vomitus, incisional bleeding, or bruising at injection sites, joint pain or immobility, and flank pain and abdominal pain. So careful monitoring is necessary to identify the early signs of abnormal bleeding and prevent potential hemorrhage. 
Okay, the nurse also can promote safety by reporting coag study results that are outside the desired range for anticoagulant therapy. Levels less than the target range may indicate an increased risk for further clot development and pulmonary emboli. However, levels above the target range indicate an increased risk for bleeding. It's important to keep the antidotes available. Protamine sulfate is available for heparin therapy and vitamin K needs to be available as an antidote for Coumadin therapy. Okay, so bleeding or hemorrhage resulting from ex excess anticoagulant may require antidote administration to rapidly reverse the anticoagulant effects. Uh, also to promote safety, we would want to avoid invasive procedures as much as possible, uh, particularly if the patient is undergoing fibrinolytic therapy. And other invasive procedures also increase the risk of tissue trauma and bleeding. Another thing that we can do to promote safety is maintain firm pressure on injection and venipuncture sites. We will have to maintain pressure for 30 minutes following uh, arterial puncture. Remember, that's the high pressure system, and you would want to maintain pressure for 30 minutes. Firm pressure reduces the risk for bleeding into the tissues. Maintaining safety following discharge is essential. And so that leads us to patient teaching on these areas.